I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute, and twice a month, I sit down with a renowned mental health care expert to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental illness. In this episode, we are talking about patient assault on clinicians, and I have here with me today Dr. Rona Hu. She is the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at Stanford University School of Medicine. She is also a clinical professor in psychiatry at Stanford University, and she is the former medical director of the Acute Psychiatric Unit at Stanford, where she has been for 20 years. Dr. Hu Can you share your experiences with patient violence over the course of your career for 20 years as the medical director of the acute psychiatric inpatient unit at Stanford Hospital? Yes, definitely. It's such an important topic, and I wanted to highlight two cases, uh, one from uh, the time that I've been at Stanford and one from actually before I started at Stanford, uh, back when I was an intern uh, at a different hospital. And the reason I wanted to present two cases is because they are uh, different patients and different types of violence. um, And I wanted to be able to share what I've learned from each of these cases. The first case uh, was a stalking case, which started when I was an intern at a very busy city hospital, public hospital. And the uh, patient was a homeless man in his 50s. And he, on the very first day, said that he was having some discharge from his genitals and wanted to have a physical exam. And at the time, you know, as a newly minted MD, you know, I had these initials after my name. And I had this immediate response of, oh, no. But then I squelched that saying, gosh, I'm a doctor now. I should be able to do this. I know how to do an exam for STDs. And um, I did allow myself to ask for someone to be in the room with me, asked for a nursing assistant to join me. Um, But I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And uh, so right away, even before I get to the, the topic, one of my teaching points is to hone your instincts and then listen to them. Because I feel like Everything can sense danger, right? Your dog can sense danger. Um, Spiders can sense danger. We're the only ones who can talk ourselves out of it. So that's probably lesson one from this particular example. Um, The man and I went to an examination room, and the uh, nursing assistant was an older man, and he, I think, didn't pick up on there being any uh, tension in the room or anything unusual. And he started to look at the eye chart and, uh, little posters and things around the room. So he had his back turned towards us. So when I, uh, got out the, the swab and so forth, um, the, uh, patient, uh, offered to help get the discharge out. He got a certain amount of uh, way into the process. You know, I, I told him to stop that and so forth. And, it took what seemed like an unbearably long time for the nursing assistant to turn around uh, and then see what was happening and then sort of say, oh, oh, wait, what? No, stop. D- oh, don't do that. Oh, don't do that. Stop that. Um, and uh, so the the patient had gotten a certain amount of way into the process, shall we say. Um, and uh, it was you know, very jarring and disturbing for, uh, for me. Um, but I think the, the patient who had, you know, serious mental illness was homeless. This was sort of the high point of, um, his, his week or possibly his year. So we had a hearing for whether to keep him in the hospital and give him medication. Um, but the, um, the the patient asked to stay in the hospital with me. Uh, his patient advocate argued that being homeless didn't mean that he was gravely disabled um, and that he hadn't harmed anyone. He wasn't a danger to himself or others. And so discharged him, even though the patient had asked to stay in the hospital in order to be with me. And that's when the stalking started. And um, uh, you can probably hear it in my voice. 
it's it's still um, upsetting to think about it because once he was discharged, I didn't know when he would show up. Um, our call schedule was one in every eight, so it was fairly easy to predict. And because he was homeless, the hospital was one of the more comfortable places for him to stay. Um, and so we had something called midnight meal for whoever was on call. Uh, he would show up at midnight meal. Um, I think he, he knew where the call room was. He kept trying to get admitted back to our unit. One interesting thing is that this was years ago when I was an intern, so we didn't have computer charts then. There were only paper charts. So it was d- difficult to get the word out to um, other people of what had happened. And frankly, some people didn't think it was a particularly wow. uh, scary thing. For for some people, you know, they imagined stalking to be sort of like, I don't know, basic instinct or yeah. um, what's the one with Glenn Close? Fatal attraction, you know, that... Yeah that a, a beautiful woman becomes romantically attracted. Right, yeah. Um, there's one with Demi Moore too, right? I think so. They're glamorized. And so at the time, the only way I could get some people to understand that this was an awful experience, because I think they were imagining, you know, some a, a beautiful woman, um, you know, enamored with them. And this was nothing like this. This was a, this was a, middle-aged homeless man missing his um, front teeth, you know, and and covered with scars and tattoos and so forth and, and, you know, unwashed and so forth. I mean, it was was not like being followed by Sharon Stone. But the only way, uh, I I can't even remember if that movie had come out at the time. Uh, This was quite a few years ago. But, But the only way that I could get some people to understand was by saying, imagine if this had happened to your mother or your wife, or your sister, or your daughter. And then, you know, that this that this precise gentleman had done this to any of, you know, had, had jumped out between cars at a parking lot at your mother and exposed himself and, you know, fondled himself, um, you know, with, with some female relative of your acquaintance. Then they would blanch and, and then realize that it was very upsetting. But this went on for months, including he would show up on the floor, you know, day or night. I remember one time the elevator opened and he was there and I hit the door close button very quickly. He obviously knew where I worked. He didn't know where I lived, but I didn't know if he knew what kind of car I drove. So on days where my hubcap was missing or something like that, this this was a, a busy city uh, public hospital. When, when my hubcap went missing, I didn't know if it was him. Um, if the uh, rear view mirror was smashed, uh, I didn't know where that had come from. And then he started bringing things. He brought a stuffed animal one time, uh, candy. And probably the spookiest thing was one where he, he had stolen this little uh, booklet from a checkout stand. And he wrote in all of the white spaces and any of the blank uh, pages and in the margins, my name and his name over and over again. And then on the last page, put Marilyn Monroe, John F. Kennedy, you know, there was a number of names, um, and then, you know, Martin Luther King, and then and then my name at the back and a little cloud around it uh, and his name, and it said together forever. Right. So the, the one thing in common between the celebrities right. uh, was that they were all dead and many of whom had been killed. And so it it was very disturbing. And it was only later that I found out that this particular patient had uh, stalked other providers as well. One time pulling a knife on a female psychologist and one time lunging over the table and choking a male psychiatrist. I realized that patient assaults on clinician can happen. They're awful. And there are probably things that we can do to either prevent them or at least um, ameliorate them. Right. Right. And now what was the second case that you were saying you wanted to share with us? Or did you want to share that a little bit later? Um, I'll share that now, because I think that as we talk about um, lessons learned, then there's different lessons to be learned from each of these. 
the second case um, happened um, when I was medical director and a patient who had been to many of the local hospitals and had a history of violence, and this time we knew about the history of violence, was admitted and was calm at first. But then when the resident told him that he would have to have a um, diabetic diet, a calorie-limited diet, because the patient was you know, very large, um, the patient said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And she said, no, really, this is for your health. And he said very calmly, you're going to regret that. And then got up, broke a chair against the wall and uh, pursued the resident down the hall with the broken chair legs that had these huge splinters, these huge wooden splinters sticking out of them. And then ripped a bit of wood trim from the wall. And uh, when he ripped the trim off, it had nails still attached to it. And then whirled that around his head, broke several of the computers, snapped a 37-pound computer off its neck and threw it at the ward clerk, broke every painting on the wall, and made a huge hole in the wall where the 37-pound computer terminal hit the wall and so forth. And actually, as soon as security showed up, calmed down immediately, we transferred him to another hospital that had experience with him. We told them, of course, what had happened. We considered pressing charges at the time. The local law enforcement was reluctant to take him into custody. They said, you know, this is a psychiatric unit. Of course, stuff like this happens. A number of years later, this patient had been in the hospital. I knew about his violence history, of course. And so on one of the occasions that he came to the emergency room seeking shelter, and I told the on-call people in the emergency room about his history, he then threatened to beat me to a pulp. And so at that point, I got a restraining order against him. That was also something where it was scary not knowing where he was. But once I got the restraining order, I knew when he was in custody and I knew when he was released from custody, he was allowed to come to the emergency room, but not to be admitted to our unit, either psychiatric or medical. When he would show up, he could be transferred to another hospital. Or if he was threatening, he could be taken into custody. That was a case where obviously it was awful and very scary what happened, but I think that it was handled a lot better. Wow. It sounds like you've been through a lot. Um, thank you for sharing those experiences with us. How, how does experiencing violent acts from a patient affect a clinician? So I feel like you touched a little bit on that already, but what would you say are some of the physical, psychological, and employment consequences? Well, physically, obviously, if someone has perpetrated violence on a clinician and the clinician is physically hurt, that, of course, is is a whole other topic. There can be severe injuries from patient-on-clinician violence. There, there have been deaths. There have been well-publicized deaths over the years from patient-on-clinician violence. So I think I'm going to focus on when that doesn't happen, the physical and psychological effects of if they threw something that didn't hit you, if they took a swing that didn't connect or kicked at you, if you ducked and got out of the way, it still affects you a lot. And I think one of the things that was in common with both incidents was some people, perhaps well-meaning, in the first case, the, the stalker, where they said, oh, you know, he doesn't want to hurt you, he likes you. And in, in the second case, when we tried to press charges with the initial assault, some people saying, well, you know, he didn't actually hit the ward clerk with the 37-pound computer terminal and that sort of thing, that he caused extensive property damage, but, you know, the resident ran away before he could catch up with her. There, there, were, there were no bodies, there were no broken limbs at that point. And so the initial reaction, I think, from some people was that everything was fine. So I want clinicians to know 
both if this has happened to you or if it's happened to a colleague, that there are ramifications. We all know what post-traumatic stress disorder is, and it includes hypervigilance. It includes difficulty sleeping. It includes startling at little things. I, to this day, more than 20 years later, always stand on the side of the elevator with the with the door closed button. Yeah, yeah. I never get on the other side. And I'm always ready to hit the door close button if I need to. I do, I think, scan the surroundings more than a lot of people. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I feel like I'm a little more savvy in some situations than I was before. And I now listen to the little hairs on the back of my neck. If the little hairs on the back of your neck stand up, uh, I advise listening to them because they probably know something. (laughs) That's the single most important advice that I've given to residents and medical students over the years. And I've had residents and medical students come back to me years later and say, thank you for the advice. I had this situation that happened and it was because of your advice that that I listen to my instincts. And, um, and so that's been very gratifying to, to hear from people. The resident, in the case where the patient pursued her down the hall, she left psychiatry. She went into another less patient-oriented specialty, and she was a really good resident. It was, it, it's, I think, a loss to our field that the patient violence caused someone to go into an entirely different field. Wow. There are so many ways. I mean, I'm not going to go into all of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder right now, but there are so many ways in which violent acts can affect a clinician afterwards, even when no physical harm happened, right? No direct physical harm. I mean, I I didn't measure my blood pressure during that whole year where I was still, you know, at the same hospital uh, where I was an intern. I imagine I had arrested <laughs> heart rate that was a little higher that whole time because I, I never knew when my stalker would turn up. Right. Uh, after internship, I I did residency at a different hospital, still part of the same system. So I would hear about him from time to time. You know, my my friends in residency would tell me when he turned up back um, at the public hospital. But when I was at my you know second year, third year, and so forth, then I felt a lot better because I felt like he wouldn't show up. It was in a different neighborhood, different part of town, you know, whole different staff. So I knew that he was less likely to show up. But it's interesting because because still, if I go back to that part of town, I still think of him. There's definitely places where I'm on higher alert right? because of that situation. Wow. So I think one lesson in terms of experiencing violent acts from a patient on a clinician, one is it's important to debrief after anything's happened, even if the thing the patient threw didn't hit you, e- even if it was a threat like the the patient trying to trap you in the room by standing in the doorway or making threats or so forth. It's it's important to debrief, and then it's important for friends and colleagues to realize that it's it's helpful to just say you know, I heard this happened. That's really awful. Let me know if I can help. And then if, if you can, offering in ways to help. I know a, a psychiatrist who was very badly assaulted. She tells me very movingly about colleagues who sort of helped wash the blood out of her hair when she was assaulted, offered to stay with her, things like that. So there are often ways in which you can help. During residency, when I had something very scary, I had friends from residency who took me to the movies, just made sure that I was with people and not just thinking about it the whole time and and just, you know, scared. This episode has been brought to you by NEI Synapse. Register now to take advantage of early bird rates. They'll only last through January 15th, 2020. So grab your seat now. Go to www.neiglobal.com. We'll see you there.